California right now. I would like to introduce David Drews. He is the farm manager for Oasis Backyard Gardens. Oasis Backyard Gardens is a family-owned business based in Colts Neck that was founded in 2009 to help homeowners, schools, and charitable organizations establish healthy, non-GMO organic gardens. Oasis has designed and constructed more than 500 organic gardens in central New Jersey. Each design is based on the client's personal needs and preferences and they're constructed and planted by their trained staff. Oasis is the only business specializing in home gar vegetable gardens to receive the Rutgers Organic Land Care Certification. This certification focuses on sustainable, environmentally friendly land care practices that improve soil health, promote biodiversity, and reduce the negative impacts on home landscapes and New Jersey's natural resources. OASIS is certified by the New Jersey DEP in landscape management and environmental sustainability. It is also a member of the Northeast Organic Farming Association. Mr. Drews started gardening in 2013. In 2014, he moved to San Diego where he took classes in sustainable urban agriculture. While there, he worked for a backyard gardening company with the CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. He also toured kindergarten to five gardening classes and had an after-school gardening club. He moved back to New Jersey in 2018 where he's getting his degree in environmental science at Stockton University. He joined Oasis in 2018, became the farm manager that year. He's now in the process of taking over the business with his fiance. So I'd like to introduce him. Thank you for having me today. Um, bear with me, this is the first time I've given a presentation like this, so I'm a little nervous. Um, again, from um, Oasis Backyard Farms, uh, we're pretty much located in this northern Monmouth County area. Uh, we have a lot of our gardens in uh, Colts Neck, Homedale, uh, Tin Falls, Thompson, Fairhaven. So we're, we're pretty much up in this area. Um, so I've broken up the presentation into three main parts. Uh, the when, whys, and what's of uh, backyard gardening and, and raised beds specifically. So the first, um, these are this is the whens. Some of the things we're going to list through uh, for children and disabled. Uh, if you have a lot of roots in your yard, poor drainage, uh, poor soil. If you have compacted soil, or if you need uh, fencing, season extension, or if you have uh, limited space. These are some of the circumstances where raised bed gardening might be best. Um, oh, sorry. All right. So for um, for children in schools, um, in my experience, I've had really positive feedback with uh, teaching kids how to garden. Um, there's a lot of resistance when they first come into the garden because they don't like vegetables and you know they don't really want to eat them, especially raw is, is a big thing. Um, but once they have the opportunity to really get involved in the growing process and see, you know, planting of the seed and caring for it and harvesting it themselves, they're, they're really proud of what they're able to do and they really um, give great feedback. Uh, a lot of the programs that I taught, they would, like I said, they would come in and just really not want anything to do with any of the fresh produce and after a couple weeks of having them in the garden, I would have to harvest before they came because they wanted to, you know, snack on vegetables as they would go through and do their maintenance, which uh, parents were very grateful for that. Um, it was amazing to watch them. They were eating raw kale, just fresh from the garden, harvested, which was surprising to me. I don't even eat kale, so. <laughs> um, so some of these are, um, some of these photos that we have up here are from some of our clients. Um, just a lot of them I have to coordinate, um, like a time that works for them, so they can be there with me um, and their kids to come out and garden, so they can kind of learn the process and see what I'm doing. Um, throughout the day and I kind of walk them through it and you know we kind of all do it together. Um, some of our clients have actually branched off and kind of done it on their own so once they've you know been with us a couple seasons uh, they've learned enough to really you know take it take it on themselves. Um, in the, the picture in the bottom center uh, that's actually the founder of our company uh, Renee Mangiobi. Uh, that was her when she was a child. They used to do the um, a home garden um, so they can provide food for themselves. Um, and she, you know, she's really developed a really wonderful business model. 
here's uh, these these kids actually in this photo is one from another client. And they actually included their vegetable garden photos on their. This is a Christmas card that they sent out to <laughs> friends and family. Um, so it's just another example of, of how you know how good of a response we get from getting the kids involved. So the next the next win would be. Um, for anyone who's disabled or elderly or anyone with back pains or has, has, that has trouble bending over, uh, the raised bed model is really great for them. Uh, you can build them to any height, you know, chest high, waist high, or whatever you, whatever you feel is comfortable, and that gives everyone you know, really easy access to get in there and just start doing it. You don't gotta worry about bending over and crawling around. That's usually what I do. I'm on my hands and knees when I'm in these gardens and stuff. So when I go into one with some of the higher raised beds, it's actually nice for me too. So and get a little bit of a break from uh, bending over. So the next reason raised beds are great is, you know, that everyone up here in this part of New Jersey, and most of New Jersey in general, has a lot of these really beautiful big trees on their property, and a lot of people don't really want to get rid of them, which I, I don't want to see them do that either, you know, but they can put off really huge root systems, especially um, you know, weeping willows and stuff that have really shallow rooted um, root systems. So the raised bed really allows you to build wherever you'd like in your yard as long as it's a suitable place. Um, you could put the bed, you know, either right on the ground or, or elevated off the ground like in the previous photo. Um, most of the um, root growth is done in the top six to eight inches, I'm, I'm sorry, eight to ten inches of soil for, for vegetable crops. So uh, our raised beds are all 12 inches deep minimum. Some of them are a little bit deeper, but this depth, you know, really gives the roots the freedom to move around, and all their finer roots can kind of find their way through uh, the larger root systems that they have underneath the beds that are due to the large trees on your property. Uh, the next reason is poor drainage. I'm sure you, some of you experience this with all the rain that we get here. Um, it certainly was a problem for me in California when we would get a lot of heavy rain and stuff. The water would kind of just pool up and sit there. Um, so the raised beds really uh, allow that water to uh, penetrate the soil surface and really move down through the root system. Um, so the, the plants can you know use as much as they need instead of just kind of sitting in it like a pond. Um, it's very easy to drown out plants. Overwatering is. Uh, you know, I've done it myself. I have an irrigation system on at my house, you know, and sometimes I just come out, or what, it was more when I started, I would come out and just water and water and stuff wouldn't be looking so good. And I, I, I didn't know why, because I would have the proper nutrients. And it turns out it was from overwatering. So the next would be um, poor soil. Uh, a lot of New Jersey has actually pretty poor soil. Um, you guys up in Monmouth County. I live down in Ocean County, and it's just pure sand. You can't grow in it. It's it's almost impossible. Um, it really holds on to no nutrients. The, since the grain size is a little larger, and there's no organic matter in the sand to hold on to those nutrients, everything really just gets flushed out of the soil, and uh, it's not ideal. Uh, the only things that really do well in soil in the sandy soil are uh, you know some of the berries and stuff, and so all the berry farms that we have down in South Jersey. So, you know, if you have poor soil, this really allows you to, uh, the raised bed allows you to really control uh, the texture of your soil and and, um, and how well it can hold on to some of those nutrients and the amount of organic matter that's in it. <coughs> and uh, compaction. Compaction is, um, it can be tough to deal with and it's pretty frustrating if you're trying to do a garden in the ground. You know, you can either have, you know, very rocky soil a, large, a lot of large rocks in there, or even if you have a large lawn that you were, you know, you've had in your yard for however long, you know, um, over time, just walking over it. Uh, any other projects you've done in your yard can really, really compact that soil. Um, you might not notice if you pick, if you, you know, take the grass off, but in the top couple inches, it might be nice and fluffy from those root systems of the grass. But once you get down in there, you'll likely find a hard pan where it's just going to make it really tough for those roots to penetrate and find the nutrients and water that they need. Um, some fencing challenges. Uh, you know, fences are expensive and you all know, I'm sure, that there's a ton of critters that love to get into the garden and just totally mow down all of your vegetables that you've been working hard to grow. So, um, the raised beds, you can really 
you know, really control that by, by building critter cages or critter fences around each bed like we have in this one. These are just made with PVC and chicken wire. Um, and you know, that really cuts down the cost of having to put up a large expensive fence. And uh, on some of the homes that do have the fence around their garden, we have to you know, dig down about a foot and install chicken wire down there so we don't get any burrowing critters in. Um, and so it can get really, um, really expensive and take a lot of time. It could be easily become a much bigger project than you anticipated just to put in a vegetable garden. Um, yeah, in, into the beds. Um, well, we, we install uh, the way we install it is you can actually lift it up. So there will be um, there will be the mainframe of the cage, and we'll put a piece of PVC that runs the length of the bed. So when you come, you can lift up the whole one side of the bed and get in there, and then you can put it back down and, and go around to the other side to get it and access it that way. So is that closed in vertically? Uh, yeah. Yeah, all, all sides are all sides are enclosed in that um, in the chicken wire. And the brackets that we use um, for our raised beds, it allows you to insert them. You can use rebar and um, put that in the ground next to your bed, and just have to insert one end of the PVC to create the arch. Um, and you know, all sides are enclosed, so they they really can't get in there. We'll put little hooks on there so they can't lift it up, um, just to make it harder for them. Yeah, I'm sure they'll figure it out eventually. It's not long enough. Yeah. Yeah, if they're hungry enough. I don't mind sharing, but they can't have it all. So. Uh, another big thing is season extension. Um, <clears throat> raised beds really, I've, I've enjoyed this probably the most out of raised beds. I can get my garden started um, in March, actually. If you install the floating row cover or if you use a vinyl cover, like in the snow, they've created, in this bottom picture, they've created a cold frame. Um, you're actually able to grow all year right in your raised bed. Um, the, if you use the vinyl covering to create the cold frame, it really allows that sunlight to penetrate and holds it in there really well. It's almost like installing a greenhouse over your garden bed. Um, and you can really get started super early. The, the soil in the box really warms up super fast and you can get in there and work it, um, amend it and stuff. Only, of course, you're only going to be doing greens um, that early in the season. Different not going to be growing tomatoes in the snow, unfortunately. And of course, uh, a lot of people's challenge is limited space for their garden. Um, if you're, you know, if you want to do something small in your yard, raised bed is, is perfect for it. Um, I certainly find it easier to have one raised bed than, you know, 25 pots that you got to move around the yard. Uh, some people like the potted gardens, which is totally fine. Um, similar to a raised bed where they'll warm up and stuff faster, but they'll also freeze harder. Um, so with the limited space you can do, if you do have a raised bed, square foot gardening is a big it's a big model. Um, there's a lot of books out there. Um, forget the name of the of the big one. Um, Mel Bartholomew or something like that. He, yeah, the square foot gardener. He has a really great um, book, and it's very easy to follow along uh, with his instructions. But basically, what they do is they lay a grid out, and in the book, he'll give you a guide as to how many plants you could fit per square foot. Um, so you can really make the most of your space and, and pack in as much food as you can um, while maximizing your yields in your yard. I've used this myself um, a couple times actually in my garden. Uh, the only thing I find frustrating is if you put the lattice and stuff in, you know, you got to kind of work around it and you bump it and stuff. But other than that, it, it really works well and it really does help you maximize your space. So we're going to get into the whys of um, raised bed gardening. Um, and again, these are some of the some of the topics that I'm going to talk about. Some of them have kind of carried over from from the first section into this, um, but we'll just touch on them a little bit differently. So the first would be uh, soil. You know, that's where your plants are growing in, and that's really where they're going to be getting all their uh, nutrients from, which is what's going to give it the flavor that everybody likes. So um, with the raised bed, you can really control the type of you know, soil and inputs that you're putting into the garden. Um, that way you can really optimize your success. Um, sometimes, you know, if you do it right in the ground, you'll have to bring in a lot of amendments and turn the soil over, but if you build a raised bed, you can, you know, buy a product from a trusted uh, nursery or landscape supply, and um, it'll really give you the um, soil texture that you need, that you're looking for, a nice fluffy, um, nice fluffy texture, plus it'll give you that nutrient-rich medium that the plants are looking for. 
Uh, it also creates a no-till model. No-till farming is becoming more and more popular. Uh, there's a lot of uh, older farmers that have done this um, and really stand by this practice. Uh, the no-tilling no really saves a lot of time, labor, and money. Uh, if you don't have the equipment to till, uh, they can get really expensive to rent or to purchase. Um, and even just walking back and forth with them, it, you know, it can be very time consuming. Um, and the no-till method actually in the long run uh, turns out to be a little bit better. You're not disturbing any of the soil biology of all the uh, critters and bugs and biology, um, not biology, bacteria that are living in that soil. So they're able to maintain their ecosystem without you disturbing it and you can come right in and plant. Um, the way I do it is, you know, you cut, or most people do it the same way, you cut the plant back right at the base of the, um, right at the base of the plant at the soil level and those roots over time will decompose and uh, water can penetrate through where the roots were and it'll, it'll really make a nice environment for your plants. Again, compaction is a, is a big problem. Um, you know, just from even walking in, if you have a raised garden bed, you know, one, one misstep can, you know, uh, compact your soil and, and not make it favorable for these plants. So the raised bed, you know, we build them so that they're a uh, manageable size for everyone to reach, whether they're three or four feet wide. We don't go any more than four feet wide because if you're standing on one side, you can easily reach two feet into the center of the bed and then walk around to the other side and, and access the rest of the, the plants from that side. So um, the raised beds just really uh, limit you stepping in them and allows you to maintain that compaction for your fire. <coughs> Um, amendments. Uh, this is something that people are always kind of skeptical. Um, they don't really, they're either timid on how much to add and they, people have, they've told me either they think they're adding too much or not enough. Um, but the, you know, the defined area, the defined growing area really makes it easy for you to calculate and follow the, the directions on the back of any um, fertilizer product that you're trying to use. Um, you know your growing area, you know where all of it's going, so it, it just makes it that much easier to calculate it and to, uh, and to distribute it versus like a, a long grow or, or um, a lot of the time if you do have an in-ground garden, you're going to be fertilizing the entire area at the start of the season, then you till it and you create pathways. So now you fertilize your pathways, which is actually making it easier uh, for your weeds to grow. So even if you walk on them, you know, whatever weeds get in there, they might not care because they're, you know, super resilient. So. Um, just makes it easier to, to add your amendments in. So the, the next why is uh, targeted watering. Uh, a lot of our gardens have drip systems in there so they can um, really put the water where it needs to go, which is right at the roots. Um, a lot of people tend to go out there and, and spray with their spray with the hose, the whole garden, you know, um, but their plants actually aren't taking up any of the water through their leaves. So if you can target where the water is going at the root system, you're putting it, you're just making it that much easier for the plants to access that water. Um, you're also saving water, which will save you money and um, it's obviously better for the environment just to reduce that waste. What are, what are those things on the right side? Uh, the things on the right, these are actually some of the corner brackets that we use for our raised beds. So um, we, we buy these from an online supplier and um, it makes it easy to install. There's um, screw holes for your boards, those, those fit a standard 2x6 uh, dimensional lumber. We use cedar for all of ours because uh, you don't have to treat it and it's naturally rotten disease resistant. So um, this, these corners and the one with the hose bib on it, you're actually able to run an irrigation line right to that so you'll have a hose bib at the corner of each of your beds or one of your beds and you can connect it so it'll just make it easier so you don't have to constantly drag like a long hose if you don't have a drip system. The picture on the left um, yeah, on your left would be um, one where they installed the drip system where the water, the lines run right down the bed so it's able to distribute it right to the soil. So those brackets, like I said, are really <coughs> easier so you're not dragging a long hose around the garden. What do you call those? Yeah, what's called? So we'll um, they have them on Gardener Supply. Um, that's the site that we get them from. Um, if you just type in raised bed brackets on Google and Gardener Supply, they should come right up. Um, they make them in all different um, all different sizes. You can get them without the hose, uh, the hose faucet, and they, they sell them at various different depths. I think ranging from um, either six or eight inches all the way up to uh, I think almost three feet deep. Um, all of ours we buy um, 
our 12 inch deep beds. Um, the, there's not really much of a need to go deeper than that if you're building one on the ground, uh, unless you like the aesthetics of a, of a larger raised bed. But as I said earlier, most of your growth is, is happening in the top eight to 10 inches, so the 12 inches is, is pretty optimal for the plants. And, and cedar wood is your choice? Yes, um, any hardwood is good. Uh, we choose cedar because it's the easiest for us to get, although it still is a challenge to get over here because it's all imported. Uh, New Jersey doesn't have much of a logging industry, so, um, all the Atlantic white cedar that we have around here, they're still not using for lumber. Um, so most of our wood ends up coming probably from California or Canada where they still have big logging industries. Um, but cedar has worked best for us. Redwood is another common one. Again, any hardwood is good. It's something that is, um, all the hardwoods have a tight pore space so it makes it difficult for insects like uh, carpenter bees and stuff. It really makes it hard for them to get in there and it doesn't allow the water to penetrate and really absorb it. Um, the raised bed I built at home, um, I made with Douglas fir, so I was trying to save some money. And I built it last summer, and it's already shown signs of breaking down. So um, any soft wood is just not ideal. You won't get the same time. Cedar is rated to last, I think, between 15 and 20 years before it starts to break down and to bow. So you'll really get um, the bang for your buck if you can invest in the cedar up front. Uh, it's very, very much worth it. What are the lengths of, uh, you, know, you said two inches by six inches? Oh, uh, yeah, those are the boards. Um, yeah, they're, they're two inches wide, um, two inches thick, six inches wide, and you can get them um, whatever whatever size you choose. It depends on the project that you're doing. Um, you know, if you were getting, if you're doing a four by four or like four feet wide, like a square bed, or our standard ones are four feet wide, eight feet long. <laughs> Uh, so we get all 12 foot boards just to reduce waste. Um, so we don't have any, uh, you know, like one or two foot cuttings that are going to end up in the scrap. So we just try to follow that size, um, any even number sizes, just to reduce the waste. Uh, what what happens to the soil after a few plant segments? Do you actually need to replace it, or is there any nutrients in I I usually do my gardening all in ground and not much of my culture. I love my and over there for nitrogen and all that. So do you need to replace the soil when you do raised beds? Yeah, um, that is one drawback of raised beds is you are gonna have to you're gonna have to really add amendments and compost to any any growing system that you're you know that you're utilizing. Um, we do have to top the beds off um, at least every two seasons. Sometimes you can get away. It also depends on what you're growing. Um, if you think about it once you fill the beds up with whatever medium you're using, uh, the plants are gonna be ta taking nutrients and pulling nutrients from that. So over time, it's, the soil is gonna become depleted of those nutrients and organic matter. So you're gonna have to constantly replenish that from season to season. Um, you wouldn't have to do it more than once a year, but you do unfortunately have to uh, come back and add. We've, we've been going through our gardens this season and uh, some of them were okay, but for the most part, they did have to have a little bit of top and off. Not, not so much. You're not going to have to refill them completely, um, but you might see, you know, two, three, four inches of depletion over a season, depending on what you're harvesting. And do you have any suggestions on the on local sources? Uh, we get ours from Mall Zones in um, Lincroft. They have really great products, uh, lots of nutrients. The plants love it. You know, um, some of our some of our plants sit in our greenhouse for quite a quite a bit of time. Um, they'll start to turn a little pale just from that nutrient depletion, and once we get into that soil, um, they just they you know turn a nice deep green color and they just take off. Uh, we do blend topsoil and compost. We do a 50-50 mix of topsoil and compost, so you're getting the right texture with all the nutrients that you're going to need. And they can they can blend it for you, but I don't think they do um, half yard increments. I think you have to buy we buy it um, by a cubic yard because we're we're doing larger projects and filling multiple beds at one shot. So. Sorry, you had a question? Um, in that square foot gardening book, um, he, he says that the vermiculite heat loss in five different kinds of compost, and that you never have to change, the only thing you have to change is add more compost to make sure mm -hmm. you don't have to change the heat loss or the vermiculite. Yeah, that stuff won't break down quite as fast. Um, the compost is definitely going to degrade, and you're going to need to add more of that, I agree. 
Um, as for his blend, I've never personally used it, so I'm not sure how it responds to constant growth. Um, I've read his books and I use the model, but I've never had a chance to actually make his his blend of soil. Um, the vermiculite. Sure and, really last, so I'm sorry. I only had the garden for about a year, so I don't know what. Yeah, I mean, you can always, um, you don't always have to do it at the start of the season. Um, a common technique for adding compost is called top dressing. Um, you just add it to the top layer of your soil, not right up against your plants, because certain composts will heat up um, as the microbes and stuff in there are continuing to break down the compost. So you don't want to put it right against the plant stems, because it could burn them and cause the plant to die back. But if you just lay the compost on the soil surface and leave a couple inches between the compost and the, and the stem of the plant, you'll be uh, replenishing the, the raised bed with um, nutrients and refilling the soil level at the same time. So not necessary to do it at the start of the season. We just do that so we don't have to worry about disturbing any of the plants once they're in the ground. <coughs> so again, it would be um, back to drainage again. Um, as I said earlier, you know, they, we have a, a lot of problems with drainage, uh, especially with the high, the high rain areas like we're in. Um, and this just makes it easier to control that drainage, like I said earlier. Um, the water can really penetrate and absorb in that raised bed and kind of move to, to where it has to be. Here's a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, wait, wait, you add the compost? You add the compost in the spring or the fall? Um, either is fine. Um, we, we typically do ours in the spring because we're doing a lot of clean outs um, from you know, whatever weeds that have come up. Um, from seeds that have made their way into the beds. We do it in the start of the season just to kind of get it out of the way. If you're in a hurry to plant, you can always go ahead and plant and kind of add it sporadically throughout the season as plants are coming out. Or you could do it in the fall to get ready for the, uh, um, the winter. If you do do it in the fall, I would recommend uh, mulching heavily with uh, straw, leaves, whatever, whatever you can get your hands on. Yeah, that's, that's the best way. If you're gonna add stuff in the, in the fall, that would be the best best approach because you don't want to add you don't want to add all that soil and compost into your garden and then just have it um, you know broken down and, and really beaten on by the by the harsh winter. Um, this certainly is my favorite aspect of uh, raised bed gardening is the less weeding. Um, if you can have a drip system where it delivers the water right to each bed your your weeding is going to be very minimal. Um, and you'll just have a lot more time to enjoy the garden itself and just to be out there and, uh, you know, like I said, enjoy the space. With, uh, if you have an overhead watering system, you'll still experience less weeding, um, but you will be watering the pathways. Um, and over time, there are going to be weed seeds that do start to germinate in your pathways, whether you have wood mulch or rock mulch. Uh, they're just so resilient, it's pretty much inevitable. Um, but with the raised beds, at least you can you know target the areas that you have to weed. And since you're growing on a smaller scale, instead of this entire enclosed area, it's just the um, raised beds that you have to primarily worry about. Um, we do hand weed a lot. However, there are organic weed controls out there that we use. Um, the one main one that we use is called Burnout. Actually, it's the only one that we use. Um, it's essentially a blend of essential oils. You spray it on early in the day before you get the heat of the day, and Essentially, it just cooks the leaves, and they just they burn. Um, obviously, not combust, but they'll just wilt and die. And it, it makes the weeding so much easier. And it is organic. It's like I said, it's just essential oils. It actually smells really good. There's a lot of clove in there, so you get kind of a a, a burnout. I believe Bonide makes it. They have a lot of other organic controls. Um, I'm not 100% sure if they are the manufacturer of that or not, but. Um, like rocks, or like that? rocks probably has it. Um, we buy ours in bulk from um, a wholesaler, so you can definitely order it online somewhere. I'm not sure. I haven't checked local nurseries specifically to see if they have it because we have a large stock of it. Um, but I'm I'm sure I'm sure it's definitely out there somewhere at a local nursery. Another great aspect of uh, I mean you could really do this with any. Any agricultural system is the is utilizing that vertical space. Um, if you just pay attention to what you have in your garden and the growth habits of them, you know you can really take advantage of that and save yourself a lot of a lot of room. Um, some people have 
They let their cucumbers snake along the ground, which is totally fine if that's what you're into. It'll certainly protect it from the sun, but if you want those really nice restaurant quality um, cucumbers or whatever they might be, if you trellis them, you'll get nice, straight, uniform fruits, and you also won't get that, um, that heavy white band from the cucumber or whatever it is, melon or gourd, um, from sitting on the soil surface. That's just due to a lack of sunlight. Uh, it's called bleaching. And um, this will just limit it. It also just increases the amount of growing space that you have. You can install the trellis at the end of your bed or in the center of your bed to create shade for some cool weather crops or um, ones that can't take as much heat. And it's just another way to maximize your, your yield and your area. Root vegetables also love the uh, raised beds. We grow ours for, last year we had a farm over in Morganville and we attempted to do carrots and beets right on the farm. Um, we didn't get great results from it. Those were all traditional, uh, it was a tra traditional row farm. Um, we were using, obviously everything was organic. Um, and we were trying to move towards a no-till method, but um, even after working the ground initially, we just did not get good yields with the with beets and primarily carrots. Um, as I said earlier, since you're controlling your medium and what goes in there, into the raised bed, they stay nice, light, and fluffy. And um, for beets and carrots, particularly or parsnips, that taproot can really have the freedom to move straight down through the soil medium and produce a nice, uh, uniform root veggies for you. So 12 inch deep bed. Oh yeah, um, so what we do when we grow our potatoes in raised beds, um, we'll, we'll do two rows of potatoes and what we'll do is we'll dig a, a trench or a furrow on either side, the length of the box, we'll do two, two furrows and you mound the soil up on either side so there will be three mounds of soil, one on the edge, one in the center, and one on the opposite edge. And then you can plant your potatoes in that furrow or trench and then as they're growing you can use the soil that you moved aside to fill them in and then eventually hold them up. So you'll actually have a mound, two mounted rows towards the end of the season, and then you'll have three uh, trenches that you'll end up with. So you can just move that soil onto the potatoes. The perennials really like them also. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have um, perennials in your yard, berries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. Um, a lot of them like really acidic soils, so having them in their own designated raised bed um, really allows you to control that acidity. As long as you're getting your soil tested each season, you can really dial it into uh, the pH that they like, uh, which will give you, you know, really wonderful tasting uh, fruit. And again, that earlier plant things. Um, as I said, you know, they they really warm up and. You can just get yourself started really, really early, which is great, especially for, for us when we use um, the, the property that we're growing right now on for restaurants is all raised beds. We don't have any in-ground rows, and uh, we were able to get in there. Like I said, same for my yard. Uh, we were in there in March, able to start planting uh, some colder stuff, arugula and spinach, all this stuff that can really tolerate colder temperatures. And uh, it works out really well because those kinds of things since they like the cooler weather, they actually have a better flavor when they're grown in a colder atmosphere. When I lived in California, I was with I was talking with my professor who uh, taught the sustainable urban agriculture, and she lived in upstate New York where she went to school um, at SUNY, which I think is affiliated with Syracuse. And um, we were talking about how much better um, you know your cold crops taste when they get that really good cold snap. I had. Um, eating kale. We, we served kale at one of the restaurants I worked in also in San Diego and it was terrible tasting. It was bitter, tough, and you know when you can get in there early you can really get some delicious uh, delicious kale crops like that. So on to the last section. Um, these are some some of the what's and you know some things that you want to consider when you're trying to do raised bed gardening. Uh, we'll go through these Taking notes and planning. This is a huge part, um, I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, into to getting your garden successful and getting it to the point that you want to be. Uh, we start planning in February for what we're going to be doing with some of our um, some of our properties where we're able to produce for restaurants. Uh, we, we'll draw up a diagram, do our full crop rotation, so we're not planting the same stuff in the same spot year after year. Um, 
crop rotation really is for, um, you know, to limit the pests and diseases from finding your finding your crops. It also helps uh, with nutrient cycling too. Um, if you plant a heavy feeder in the same spot year after year, uh, after a few years you're going to find that it's going to be hard to get that plant establishing. So if you can kind of move it around, um, it'll really help you out. Also, um, making note of when diseases hit your garden and what types of pests are hitting your garden will really you know, help you for the future. You can almost expect them. Um, a, lot of, a lot of pests have you know, multiple life cycles throughout the season and if you strategically plant um, and plant ahead, you can you know, plant either before or after those life cycles so you won't have to really worry about doing any pest management. Um, flea beetle is a big one. Um, they really eat up our leafy crops, not so much lettuce, but all our bok choys and, and some of those uh, Asian greens they really like to get into. Um, so if you can plant, uh, if you can plant ahead and get them in the ground to miss those life cycles, you'll you know, save yourself a lot of stress and time. So the size of your garden. You want to make sure, if you are building a raised bed garden, you want to make sure that you're building them all to a uniform size. Um, this is just going to make it easier, again, like I said earlier, for adding amendments and just to maximize the size of your um, the size of your garden. A lot of people think the bottom image um, to misalign the edges. They think they say that that makes like a stronger construction, or that's what I've heard at least. And um, it's just you're you're cheating yourself out of a few inches here and there, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're trying to you know produce enough food for your family and for friends to give away, um, those inches add up into square feet, which can you know really um, impact the amount of plants that you can fit into your space. Actually, here's an example of. Um, one of the ways that you can do the potatoes, you can here's kind of a visual of how they um, they furrowed out the um, the two rows where they're going to plant the potatoes, and then as the season goes on and continues, they can use the soil that they set aside um, to mound them back in to really fill them up. So is that distorted? I mean, that looks really wide. Okay. That is a large one. So they were actually walking in that one. That's um, what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, that was one. They, they kind of insisted on it being there. Um, it was in a it was a great spot. It was a lot of sun. Um, they had a, it was a really windy section of their yards. So they had a lot of uh, air moving through to um, keep that which limits disease if you have a lot of air flow. Um, so that was just kind of what they insisted, and that's you know that's fine. It's totally up to the homeowner. We we really try to cater to what they want, what they need. So. Um, if they don't mind walking around and compacting a part of their garden, uh, you know, that's what we'll do. We advise against it, and that was just something they wanted, so, you know, we went ahead and did it for them. And it's, it's not a make or break, um, but you are sacrificing some growing area. They are definitely going to have to walk down that center path, um, and even probably along the fence, too. Um, but, again, it's, they're all custom gardens, and it's really, you know, what the homeowner wants and what they like, so we try to incorporate that for them as best we can. So the space of your garden, um, <clears throat> this can be, you know, sometimes people want to pack stuff in there. Um, it's always good to plan a little bit larger than what you think you're going to need. Not so much for growing area, but you want to make sure you have enough room to move around in there. Um, especially if you're going to be showing people the garden and stuff, you don't want to be trying to shuffle around each other to get in and out of beds or um, just to get around. Sometimes you'll even think like a foot and a half might be big enough for you to walk through, but once the plants are pushing out, as you can see some of these tomatoes or even the squash is totally taken over that pathway. So you're going to be brushing past plants. You can you know, damage them, which will invite uh, more pests and disease into your garden. Um, so we give uh, three feet spacing between each bed. Uh, that's plenty of space to have you know, one or two people you know, walking. You know, they can walk side by side. You can get wheelbarrows in easy or a garden cart, whatever equipment you're using, and it just it just makes it that much easier. So if you have the extra if you have the extra space, I definitely recommend uh, choosing a little bit wider pathways just to make it easier for everybody. Um, so the location of your garden. The location is really important. Um, you know, you really want to make sure that you get are getting at least six to eight hours of direct sunlight. That's and that's a minimum. Um, anything over that is a bonus. Your plants will really greatly appreciate you for having, you know, selecting an area with you know 10, 
plus hours of direct light. Um, the thing to consider also is how much light you're getting in that area year round. Um, some people think only in the summer, but if you're if you're able to get really great winter exposure, all your um, um, some of your perennial fruit plants are really going to like that and stuff. Anything that will hold leaves are really going to appreciate that. Um, it also keeps the soil uh, a little bit warmer. It doesn't seem like it does much, but if you have mulch, that buffer zone can really create a difference. Um, but you do want something south facing, um, so you're going to maximize your light from sunup to sundown, and uh, also somewhere with a lot of airflow, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm sure you've seen uh, white powdery mildew or downy mildew are big, big problems in the gardens, especially around here, and that can just be to um, excess moisture and um, that airflow will kind of help carry that moisture out of the garden to create, uh, you know, disease-free space. Also, something about location too. You don't, if you have a large yard, um, if you have a spot near your house that might be a little bit less favorable than something maybe tucked back in the far back corner of your yard, that might be better because then, you know, if you want to harvest for a meal that you're about to cook or if you have guests over, you know, it'll be closer to your house. So um, that that just comes down to preference, though. So. Um, main thing is your your sun exposure and your uh, hours of sunlight. Access to water too. Access to water. That was yeah. That's another big one. I even have that written down. I missed it too. But uh, access to water is huge. I mean, if you don't have a hose bed near you, you're gonna rely on uh, rainwater, which is great to water your garden with. But you want to make sure that you can get out there on the those nice hot days. And again, vertical space. Um, I just said, I really advise you to, you know, take note. You don't have to research this. Um, you know, just pay attention to what you have growing in your yard. Read the back of your seed packets and try to take it as much advantage of it as you can. Um, I've even trellised and I've seen people trellis some things that aren't traditionally trellised. Um, tomatillos and um, orange flowers. I've seen trellis. I trellis my tomatoes. I don't have them in cages or on stakes. I use um, I have a cattle panel arch installed in my garden. Should have included that picture, but we're able to weave it through um, the fencing, and they, they do really well. And it's it's much easier. You don't got to worry about um, it's called cattle panel or hog hog fencing. Um, they sell it at Tractor Supply, and it's relatively cheap. Um, it comes in. It's kind of hard to move. They're 16 feet long by about four or five feet wide, but they're they're pretty cheap, and I've installed them with um, two fences. Uh, two fence posts on either side. I just pounded them into the ground and I use zip ties just to secure it to them. And it's a really strong, sturdy arch. Um, the gauge of the wire is much thicker than um, if you were going to just buy garden fencing from Home Depot or something. Um, so it's, it's a very rigid structure and it lasts a long time. I've had it up since last year. There's not a spot of rust on it and it, it holds a lot of weight. We actually have strawberries in some gutters that we have hung on the inside of the trellis too, and it's it's holding up just fine with all that weight on it. So you plant the tomato plants on the outside of the arch? Yeah. So I have on mine on mine there's um, I have two raised beds in the center path. Well, there's four raised beds in the garden. The two center beds are spaced five feet apart. So I arched the trellis. Um, I buried it six inches deep in my bed, and it gave me about a seven foot um, arch height down the center. And I plant the tomatoes on not the path side but on the inside, so I guess it would be towards the center of the bed, along the, in, um, along the bottom of the trellis. And as they grow, I just weave them through. With cucumbers and peas, they kind of take to it themselves, um, but we just weave it through and, you know, we don't have any, any ties on there, no clips or nothing. They just, they're standing up fully straight. How, how wide would it be? Um, probably, probably three or four inches um, in certain points. Some of the um, hog, panels you can get with different um, spacing. Some are more of a rectangular, like a two by three rectangle, or you know you can get larger ones, four by four. Um, they have a, a huge selection of different sizes and shapes that the openings come uh, that the openings come in. So you can really pick and choose once you're there, uh, taking a look. Again, Tractor Supply has those. Um, I got mine right from uh, Tin Falls. And Mark's in the Oh, it's super easy. You can see everything. Um, all the fruit is just hanging there. You don't gotta dig around for it. You don't gotta brush leaves. I didn't miss a single fruit last year, um, versus the, some of the ones when you know you have um, cucumbers if they're snaking along the ground. You know, you miss a lot of them. You can't find them. Yeah, you can't find them. Um, the arch trellis, I found, um, it's just super easy. You can see everything right when you walk up to it from both sides too. 
Um, so when you're actually standing in your tunnel, you can see them right there, or if you're on the outside of your garden, you can see them. You have to take a picture of that. Definitely. Yeah, I should have put it in there. I, I know. So I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. But it's you can follow me on Instagram. I, I post on our Instagram if, if you guys have Instagram. Um, we have pictures up there of our artist travels. And if I get some emails too, um, it would be more than, oh, she can, uh, she actually has a picture of my fiance. This is my fiance, Deja. She can pass that around and you guys can take a look at us to, uh, so you can get an idea of the art shows. Um, so another thing that you want to keep in mind when you're doing the raised bed gardens, especially if you're, you know, growing at your house, is um, selecting high yield crops, anything that's going to grow multiples, so you can harvest and come again. Um, a lot of salads you can do that surprisingly with too, a lot of salad lettuces you can cut uh, two inches above the base of the soil, and usually they will regrow another head, but you won't get more than two harvests from them. Otherwise, they'll start to grow kind of funky. Um, but, you know, most of your garden staples, tomatoes, green beans, everything pictured here, you know, they produce multiple times throughout the season. Um, so it's just a good thing to keep in mind when you're, when you're planting, um, just to keep your, your productivity high. Succession planting. Um, succession planting is you know, a great tool if you can if you can get the timing down and if you're starting your own seed. It's hard to do with nursery crops because it can get expensive if you're buying them from a local nursery, um, just because you'll have to constantly be buying be buying you know self packs of plants. Uh, but if you start everything from seed, generally if you're you know planting everything uh, every two weeks, that's what that's how we do it. Every two weeks we'll reseed our crops, bok choy, lettuces, and stuff. That way we can have a constant harvest throughout the season. Once you harvest you know, a certain section of crops and you can come right in, you have your other plants ready to go, you can get them right in the ground and, and you won't skip a bee in harvest them. you'll be able to just keep going throughout the season. Um, and you can do it with you know, anything. They have uh, some turnips and carrots in there, radishes, you can just leave a little extra space for those because they don't, the tap-rooted crops don't really like to be transplanted. Um, so if you just leave a little bit of extra space for them, you can you know, um, plant a section, then two weeks, plant a section, wait two weeks, plant another section. That way you're just maximizing your harvest of that same crop throughout the season. Um, and the organic. Uh, this is probably the number one thing that we are trying to maintain throughout our, uh, our business model. Um, you can make a planter out of anything. You know, wheelbarrows, tubs, uh, buckets, pots. <coughs> There's certain materials that you do want to stay away from. Um, it's it's really great to repurpose materials, but when you're repurposing wood from you know old construction projects, they could be treated. They could have had you know lead paint or, or harmful stains on there that aren't good. Um, over time, they will leach into your soil, and the plants will uptake uh, some of those uh, some of those contaminants. Um, it can either cause uh, poor growth of your plants, or you can just be ingesting it, which is not good. Um, again, that's why we chose the cedar, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, there's no there's no treatment on them. They're all natural, um, and they do a great job at you know standing up against the elements. I have some other pictures actually down here. Some some other raised bed ideas. So here's the wheelbarrow planters. Just some old wheelbarrows. Um, a lot of people ask though if they'll rust or not. And the rust actually isn't so bad for your uh, for your soil. Um, there's naturally iron in your soil. Uh, all over New Jersey. I know there was a big industry uh, a long time ago. I know down at Alaire State Village, they used to uh, mine the bog iron down there. So um, I would be more concerned about the paint if you're using something like that, but you can always remove the paint before you plant. Um, and the rust isn't really going to do anything to your plants. Um, this garden, actually, uh, the one on the far left, they actually used um, hay bales to create a giant raised bed. Uh, great idea, but that one is, uh, whoever, I didn't take that picture. I found that online, to be honest with you, and they're going to have their work cut out once those hay bales start breaking down. Um, we actually, yeah, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it gets pretty messy in there. Um, we actually had last season at our farm, we had planted directly into um, hay bales, so we didn't use them as a perimeter for our raised bed, but we actually used that as our growing medium. Um, so if that was something you're interested, if you like the look of them, you can condition them. Um, just basically doing the same thing as you would your soil. You're adding you know, um, organic water soluble nutrients to the tops of the hay bales. Um, as it rains or as you water it, those nutrients are being um, dissolved into the water and then the straw is gonna hold them. Um, 
It actually works great because you get a lot of air penetration through the through the hay bales, which is going to keep your roots really happy because they'll be they'll be getting plenty of oxygen. Um, and also, the carbon that is breaking down over time in those hay bales is, is really going to make those plants happy. We had um, cagoosa squash growing out, and they were huge, massive plants that we you know put right into straw bales. Uh, straw bales. The only tough thing was getting the seeds to germinate. We didn't start our seed ahead of time, so we were actually direct seeding into the straw bales, and we just had to keep them super moist, and they ended up germinating and doing just fine. Um, pallet gardens I've seen a lot lately. Um, those are certainly good to utilize if you can find um, some good ones that are not treated. Um, if there's any breweries in your area, I would actually check out the breweries. They get a lot of their hops shipped in from Canada, and Canada has the safest pallets to use. Um, you can look online for the stamps. I, I don't have a picture of them or offhand. I don't remember what they say. Go ahead. Um, is there any benefit to leaving the top boards on? Or? Um, no, that's just so you can um, you know, get your spacing in there. It's, it's almost like a, a pre-measured uh, raised bed. You can pry them off if you want and just reattach some to the sides to hold in the medium. That would be my only suggestion is to make sure that you're putting like a side cap on so your, all your soil is not spilling out um, throughout the season as you water. Um, but you can certainly remove them. It's almost like a version of square foot garden, even though those are a little bit closer. Um, but Canada, if you have, like I said, if, if you live near a local brewery, they are they do have the best pallets that you can use. Um, they they're not treated with arsenic or any of those other ones. They've they've turned to like alternatives to treating them. I'm not sure on what's in there, but it, it's it's a better product. I wouldn't advise it still if you want to be you know super organic and picky like I am, I, I wouldn't use them, but it's certainly not harmful like uh, the other pressure treated woods. Uh, some more stuff you can use, you know, whole whole logs. I, I personally really like those. We actually had a picture in the first one um, on, on the intro slide of um, one that they actually made look like a bed. Um, but they used, you know, the whole logs and I think it gives a really nice natural look. Um, if you are repurposing logs on your um, property, if you know what types of trees they are, I would look to see if they're safe to grow in. Um, trees have tannins in them, which are their natural oils. I know black walnut is a bad one to plant near, and it will inhibit the growth of your soils. Also, if you're using any pine, um, it's going to create more, more of an acidic atmosphere for the roots, uh, which they're just not going to like. Certain nutrients are only available at certain pHs in the soil, so if you have a very acidic soil, you might have enough nutrients, but it's not in a form that the plant roots can uptake. So um, that's just something to watch out for. And then um, cinder blocks. Cinder blocks are pretty great. I like the I like that you can plant in the perimeter of them. Um, and then the sandbags, which is kind of a neat idea. Um, hopefully you can get those pre-filled so you're not filling up 50 bags of sand. So the biggest one for our clients, um, aside from the organic model, is the aesthetics and how nice it looks. Um, it really makes a tidy, neat garden, defined pathways and um, growing space. You know, it's just, it, it looks nice. You can keep a very good symmetry with the garden uh, when it comes to planting. And um, it just looks great. You know, there's, there's no doubt about that, I think. Um, my first garden was in the ground and it, they, they look great, you know, if that's what you're into. I, I like the natural style, but once once I put the raised beds in, it just really kept the, the yard neat and clean. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, in the stress of disease, do your beds ever have uh, fungus infection in, in the soil? Um, not so much in the soil. Um, you know, there's naturally fungus and mycelium that grow um, right. in, in all soils. Um, but most of your diseases that you're going to get from plants are they're going to show its symptoms on the plant itself or um, if it's a fungus it's going to be um, yeah, for fungus it's going to show itself more on the plant. But the, the fungus will be in light for example it will be in, your, in the soil. Yes. Right. Do you have to remove the soil from that bed the top layer of soil from that bed? Um, I haven't had that. I haven't had uh, too much of a problem with light myself so I, I've never really had the opportunity to look up um, how to treat it. Um, you can continue to condition your soil um, and, you know, add certain amendments. It could be um, diseases and pests, they feed on the plants because there's some sort of deficiency. Essentially, the plant is sick. So if you can, if you can figure out why the plant is deficient in a certain nutrient or nutrients, um, 
you'll be able to correct that and the plant will be able to kind of defend itself from that disease. Um, as far as soil removal and remediation, um, I know with certain things, certain pests like um, nematodes, you can solarize your beds. That's essentially just laying a plastic sheet. Yeah, laying the plastic sheet and you're basically cooking them um, and killing them so it will remove them from the soil. But as for the blight, I'm not, I'm not too sure how you would uh, remediate that obviously. Can't, I really can't. You just cut off the leaves and just hope yeah, it's just kind of keep it keep it going. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are fungicides that you can spray that are organic. Uh, we use ours again, are from Bonite. Um, Spinosad is a big one. You know, it's not favorable to spray. We that we really treat that as a last resort. Um, but sometimes it's you know even if it's for organic control, it's better to spray and wait a couple days for any of those. Um, that way you're not eating, ingesting any of them, uh, so it'll be, become safe. But sometimes spraying is better than, than totally losing your garden uh, to a disease, which could be uh, pretty terrible and discouraging for a lot of gardeners. Uh, just some more pictures of different gardens. Um, sorry, sorry that they're a little bit blurry, but um, you can really see, too, in these pictures how large these plants get when you have the right uh, nutrients and the right soil in there. Um, it's almost overwhelming. I forget each season how large some of these plants can really get and how healthy they, they actually can be. And, uh, you know, if you, sometimes I'll plant them a little too close and then it gets overwhelming trying to figure out which ones to take out and how to manage them and stuff. But, um, you know, it's definitely a good problem to have large healthy plants, so it's not so bad. Um, again, you know, destination. Um, the raised beds, you know, they can really do that. And if you're if you're looking for a destination garden, this will kind of give that to you. You can really be creative with how you're building these gardens and designing them, um, so you can make it a desirable place in the yard. Um, this one, you know, you can see the fountain in there. We've had some with sitting areas right in the center of the garden, and they have ponds and stuff. So you can really go and almost spend your whole day. If, if you got enough food out there, you probably wouldn't even have to leave for lunch. Um, you can just hang out, and no one will bother you. you can, Hide behind some plants and your kids or whoever will leave you alone. It's probably pretty nice. Uh, here's another shot of that destination garden. Uh, this was a really elaborate project that we took on. And, uh, it was worth it though. They were super happy with it in the end. They had the money to spend and that's what they wanted, you know. So it came out really great. It's a beautiful, beautiful garden. Um, is that sand? Why is it so white? Is that or grass? Uh, it's decomposed granite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a pain. It was a pain to move in, but luckily I didn't have to do it, so I was pretty excited about that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot, but it you know it does a really great job. There's almost no weeds grow in that garden. Um, it, it is rock solid. You might as well put down concrete. It's nothing really germinates in there. Here's another destination garden that we did. Um, this one was more ornamentals and uh, perennials than anything. There wasn't too much uh, vegetables going on in this spot of the yard at least. Um, but again, just shows the creativity and uh, how diverse you can make these gardens and really create a custom space for the homeowner uh, and yourself, you know, depending on the project. This one actually had, if you walk, um, if you walk this way in the photo, they actually have a whole uh, orchard on this side. It was really nice. They, they had a large yard and a lot of space. They really wanted to uh, really wanted to take use of it. Another shot. So, what we really aim to do, in, and the exciting part of my job, is taking these you know areas like this in people's yards that they're really not using. Um, and we certainly did it in our yard. It was an awkward corner that we built our garden in, and. Um, you know, once they're done, they you know it really transforms the space. And you know, if you're paying you're paying property tax a lot in New Jersey, so might as well make use of your yard. Um, and I don't think there's a better way to do it than to feed yourself from it as well. So not only are you paying for that space, but you're able to cut down costs at the grocery store. Um, the picture on the right is um, actually one of the designs that we have done. Um, I mean, we've done tons of them, but we use the computer software to do the general layout of the garden so the homeowner can you know see it before it goes in. And uh, once we agree on the design and the layout, you know, then we're able to start uh, going in and, and uh, do the construction piece of it. Um, it's a really great tool. This one actually that we use is very inexpensive. It's called um, Grow Veg. 
and it's about 20 bucks for the year. It has hundreds, if not thousands of plants in there. A lot of them I've never even heard of. Um, ornamentals, fruit trees, um, all your, your basic um, vegetables and herbs are in there. Uh, they have stuff where you can design your pool into it. You can really go crazy. It's, it's a, almost more for landscape architecture. It's really great for it. Um, but we utilize it for the, uh, for the vegetable gardens. And um, there's also features in there where it can tell you the, how to do the um, square foot gardening and um, also your succession plantings. And it'll tell you all the spacings in there and you know how much of what you can fit. You answered my question already. Oh, cool. <laughs> So yeah, I, I suggest they, they do a free trial. I suggest getting in there and playing with it. I mean, even if you're just an ad, you know, starting off or whatever, it, it's it's fun to play around with, and you can kind of make a lot of designs, and uh, you can get lost in that program pretty easily for a while. Here's another design. This is a large garden that we did, um, not quite as big as the the one on the next within the next couple slides, but um, again, just shows you know the different layouts that you can do. Um, this this first one was a little bit more tricky because of the uh, because of the center. Once you start getting these awkward like octagon shapes, it gets tricky trying to put in weed barrier and fencing and stuff. But um, they look really cool when they're done. Do you have the after photo with that? I do not. Sorry, <laughs> did a bad job with the this. Um, yeah. So again, just the diversity of uh, the designs that you can do, and depending on what you want. So this one is going to be super massive garden. Um, I would call it more of a mini farm than a garden. It's just absolutely huge. You can see in the picture on the right how many you know pieces of paper it took to actually print out the design to look at it on a on a tabletop, and it was uh, pretty expensive just to print with all the color. In it. <laughs> it's probably a waste of paper. I probably shouldn't have done that, but it's okay. So there's um I think. I believe this one's from the cousin's garden. This one, oh, yeah. yeah. This was the this was before I was in the company. Um, so this one went back quite a ways, but I'm sure you guys have all seen it. We actually did build um, we did build this one. Um, super massive, really beautiful place, um, and they do a lot of great stuff. They grow some really good food. Um, you can see uh, it's, it might be kind of hard to see because of the shade, but in between the beds, um, there's like a black layer down. Uh, we put that in all of our pathways that have uh, raised beds, that's, that's just a weed barrier. Um, it does not have pre-emergence in it, so it is organic. It's really more of a breathable tarp. Um, it allows all the air and water to penetrate, but it does a pretty good job at cutting down the amount of weeds that come up in your pathway. Um, if you do a wood chip mulch, um, you are going to get weed germination in there, uh, you know, after a couple years due to those, um, due to the wood chips breaking down, but if you put like a rock or gravel or sand down or something like that, um, It'll be easier to pull out, and you won't get quite as much. But. Here's some more shots, kind of from the road. I believe these are from the Cousin Garden, also. I, I have thousands of pictures on my computer of plants, so it's hard to tell which ones are which. Um, but you know, it, it also shows how you know neat and tidy they can really become with the raised beds. And uh, the obelisk planters are a really nice touch too in the top picture. Um, another cool thing, uh, not necessarily raised bed gardening, but it can take use um, of that vertical space. A lot of places are doing this now with um, aeroponics and hydroponics. Um, these are all tower gardens. I think Bellworks has some. Um, a lot of restaurants are doing this now. Um, you basically insert, you, you plant the seeds into, um, I, th I think it's like, they make like some kind of fi fiber out of broken down rock. It's, it's really weird. It almost feels like a, um, like a brillo pad or a steel wall, it almost feels like. Um, and then they cycle the nutrients through the inside of the tube, um, and they're basically, um, you know, all the roots are suspended in water, and they're feeding them, you know, with um, through a fertigation system, which is just liquid fertilizer um, that you can run through your irrigation system. Um, you can do lots of stuff with this. I've seen tomatoes done with it too, and they kind of hang upside down. And um, a lot of leafy greens are pretty popular because the high nitrogen fertilizers you can or sorry, well that you can flush through them. Um, they're they're pretty cool. It, they're really interesting. Um, and it definitely makes good space. You can keep them right inside too. They sell some online. This one's actually right inside. Um, this was in my boss's office. 
and um, I believe she took that picture in the middle of winter, so she was able to have fresh lettuce throughout the year, just growing right in, right in her office, you know, so whenever she took the lunch break, she could just take it and bring it with her. Um, on the right, too, uh, those are cucumbers, so you can even get some of your larger fruit around there. Um, I'm not sure how that works. I, actually, no, they sell those trellising systems that can go on the outside of the of the water tank, and they secure right to the right to the whole unit. Um, they're pretty sturdy, and uh, yeah, you can really, they're pretty versatile in what you can grow. And they make some really nice, really nice greens, especially. So that's all I have for you. Um, thank you for having me. I appreciate you and I hope you guys can all, you know, continue the season with your gardens. Can you give us a sense of prices that we charge? It's hard to give a ballpark because they're all so different. Um, it really depends on what you want to do. Um, I'd be more than happy to come out and do a consultation for people if anyone's interested. Uh, we do free consultations. Um, but it's, it's hard to give uh, a decent ballpark without having someone discouraged on the price. Um, so unfortunately, I'm sorry. Do you recommend mulching for raised beds or anything? Um, the soil there. I always recommend mulching if you can. Um, straw is going to be your best bet, um, not hay. Uh, if you follow that old saying, you know, hay is for horses, it really is. You know, the hay has all the seeds in it, so if you, if you buy hay to mulch with it. Okay. You can't, you can't get any salt hay. Yeah. Yeah, I know that was very hard to find. But we can use hay without seeds. Okay. I won't say totally without seeds, but it's easy to figure Yeah, at least it's, it's, it's less. Doable. Okay, cool. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that, but yeah, um, any of those materials I find the easiest to mulch with. If you're using wood chips, um, you know, they can damage the plant stems a little bit more. Um, and the hay or straw is just really easy to separate or to pull off the bed. If you're going to amend it or... You can make it right up. Yeah, yeah, you can pull it right off. It's super easy. I would always recommend mulching um, every chance you get. It really keeps that soil quality high. Um, it holds moisture in, and it creates a you know a real buffer from that strong atmosphere or uh, weather that we're getting here in New Jersey. Did you bring any business cards or things that folks could? I have a few with me. I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, I can always email people. I'll leave these on the table for you. Okay. Um, well, folks, yeah, you can tell yeah. me. That's, that's my cell number. It's 732-232-6938. Or I have an email, you can always reach out to me. It's dave at oasisbackyardfarms.com. And we're, yeah, yeah. And, uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I believe we do have a Twitter, but I do not go on Twitter, so don't look for me on there. And um, Facebook, we've actually been having some trouble with. It's up there, but we haven't been able to access it, so we're working on fixing that. Um, but if you know what Instagram is, we have, I'm on there all the time, sharing videos and pictures of stuff that we're doing. Um, and you can get an inside look kind of at some of the gardens that we maintain throughout the season, as well as our greenhouse. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you guys again. I really appreciate you coming right. to me. Thank you. I just want to say that this will be on YouTube. If you go for C, if you search Silu Home Dell, C I L U Home Dell. C I L U Home Dell. And Jenny would like to make a few announcements. Um, I should have perhaps mentioned this before, but oh, I talk so loud, you don't need to like it. Um, 